Welcome to the studio at African Utility Week. Today I'm with Silas Zimu from Sazlon Energy. Welcome, Silas. Um, I'd like to ask off, straight off about South Africa's war room on energy. How do you think things are going there? Look, the, 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 the discussions of the war room uh, are private, and I don't think uh, much has to be divulged to the, to the public. It's things of strategic nature. Um, but uh, there, there's, there, 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 there is a need for them to tell us what mitigating factors are they bringing for or against load shedding. You know, everybody's going through load shedding. Everybody has been told the war room will eliminate load shedding, and something has to come out of there to bring hope to the, to the constituency of South Africa. It is led by a high, high delegation, uh, as, as in the vice president, so we expect that the, the, the decisions decision-making, unusual boardroom decision-making gets taken overnight by SMS, by uh, WhatsApp, so they don't need to meet. They can talk over the phone and help the country get out of uh, what it's going through now. What is important, though, is that the war room should not disempower ESCOM. ESCOM board, ESCOM Expo must still have their powers as per the corporate governance structure. ESCOM has got that. The war room hasn't got that governance structure. So. They, they have to be very careful as well that they don't go beyond what they, they, they can do. Uh, they, you know, short of saying anything that has to do with tenders and all that, really has to go through ESCOM because that's where the, the corporate governance structures are. Otherwise, uh, the delegation of authority of the war room has not been pronounced. Uh, but I think as a support to ESCOM, it should work. They, they should just, I just can't wait for that hope the first hope that the war room must give us is, hey, there goes load shedding, you know, then we'll give them enough time and space to do other things. Yeah. And in terms of the renewable energy program in South Africa, that has taken off very well, and renewable energy globally as well. Where do you see the peak in terms of our renewable energy taking place, where we actually hit that, that spot where we say, it's enough now? Renewable energy is not going to be enough. Uh, and as you correctly say, we are actually leading in the world. Uh, everywhere else in the world except Turkey, India, uh, 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 Uruguay, everywhere else it's dead. And that's why all these big role players are in South Africa. So it's a beginning of it, it's a good start. Uh, if, if, you, if you consider the biggest challenge that we have now on the, on the distribution side, on the demand, places like Soweto where people have not paid and uh, 8 billion are owed to ESCOM, maybe we should look at renewable solutions for those people and let them have access, free access to electricity with no load shedding for life because we're not creating enough jobs to can continue charging them. You know, it's actually short of being criminal considering that the constitution stipulates that the service authority, which is, which is the mayor, chooses the service provider, which is, could be a municipality or ESCO. And then the constitution says people have, must have access to services. One of those services is electricity. So by constitution, we give people electricity, and after three months, we cut them off because they've not paid. Hey, I can't wait until one person take us to court. It's a constitutional court matter. So uh, I think technology is there to can help those struggling communities to be off the grid. Yes, there's a lot of money being, being put in those uh, uh, infrastructure of to take electricity to those people, but uh, maybe 50% of Soweto has to be off grid and, it, and it, it, it can be done. Moving away from renewables and looking at coal fired power plants, and in South Africa we have Madupi and Kusile with incredible delays and going over budget. How is this going to impact South Africa in decades to come? Look, for me, Midupi and Gusile are long overdue. And it's now clear that we need expertise to manage the contractors at Midupi. We need to be very clear as to who is the main contractor, who is the subcontractor, 
who is the client. We cannot have a strike by subcontractor employees affecting a project like Midupi. It's, it's a national project, it's a national key point. Uh, but we need to also, we cannot have uh, ESCOM going in there to negotiate with those employees because they, you then bypass and take over the responsibilities and accountabilities of those subcontractors. So we need people that are very well learned on how to deal with industrial related matters. But if, 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 if you look at the megawatts that Midupi and Gosilia are going to bring, they're not going to help the country to tell the truth. I believe that uh, when in 2007 we announced that we're not going to connect new customers onto the grid, a lot of malls, a lot of um, uh, private development townhouses and cluster homes stopped. And that alone is a 5,000 megawatt backlog that we need to pay back to bring back that economy that we've stifled. Then we need another Midupi or Gosile and IPPs for another 5,000 megawatt. So uh, I strongly believe that uh, we should be looking at uh, fast-tracking Midupi. Uh, if, if need be to replace the current contractors there, let's do it. We're all suffering. <laughs> The cost of Midupi alone has gone far beyond the cost of IPPs. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact. Who's paying for it? You and I. Looking at energy throughout Africa, um, do you see there is a disconnect between energy policy and the energy projects that are coming on board? Yeah, the, <laughs> that's an interesting question. You know, the, uh, in, in 2009, I think we were in Monaco. Uh, utility CEOs and we were briefed by the then uh, uh, um, Prime Minister of the UK, Tony Blair and there's two things he said on that day which keeps haunting me. One, he said Europe and the US cannot ignore India and China because they're going to be a big market themselves and if we ignore them they, they can be too big and Russia for, for, for some reason saw that opportunity and BRICS was formed and China and India are part of that. Big, big economy. The second thing was, he said, politically, they announced solutions for energy. But we engineers take time to convert those political statements into projects. Now, coming closer home, every state of the nation address, the president talks about access to energy. Every minister, energy talks about access to energy every premier talks about access to energy every mayor every member of the mayoral committee the ward councillors talk about energy but engineers are not converting those talks into projects now if we have to convert all of those talks into projects we may have a challenge of affordability can we afford to do everything maybe that's where as a country have to say or as a continent let's prioritize why should you have a, a, a road which is tight when you don't have electricity? And when you have 10 rand, you split it, t 5 rand to electricity, 5 rand to, 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 to other things. Maybe those other things must wait. And then we put everything and show that the energy, because energy leads the economy. It's not the opposite. Start with energy projects and then the rest can follow. And lastly, if you were appointed CEO of ESCOM, what would be on your list of priorities? I would fly the world, I would fly around the world. CEO of ESCO, own helicopter. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Actually, if you, if you look at what has been happening up to now with load sharing and everything, we're concentrating too much on the supply side. And I believe, as a customer, ESCO has forgotten about me. Uh, we need to go back. In the regulation 047, it does stipulate how many meetings that ESCOM or utilities must hold with customers. Inform customers of what we're doing on the supply side. They should not read about it on the newspapers only. Uh, that's why we have customer executives. That should be visiting customers. Yes, it's not easy in some of those meetings. They insult us and all that. But after informing the public, you actually get the joy. And out of 10, five of them say, thank you for informing us. And that's all you need. So. Uh, I would concentrate more on the customer side, informing uh, the customers, educating our customers. We keep saying to the customers to avoid load shedding, switch off this, switch off that. But on the other side, we say to them, electricity kills, don't touch that box. Who has to then uh, uh, switch off 
the things. My grandmom is scared of opening that box. She grew up knowing that electricity kills, but she's not been educated enough to be shown in the box what to touch. So customer education, very, very key. Imagine if, if I say to you, now that I've, I've educated all the customers, can everybody, an hour before load shedding, if you can all switch off your swimming pools, countrywide, no load shedding. No load shedding. But pe other people don't even know where their swimming pool motors are. So education is very, very, very key. And customer engagement. Customer engagement. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for watching. Thank you.